All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Joe Cushman. We're at Three Mile Vineyard out in the Dalles. It's June 3rd, 2022. Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, first question to get us started is why wine? Why wine? Well, for, for me, that, that kind of ends up being, being why grapes. But, you know, wine has been in front of me my, my whole life. Um, I'd be the third generation in my family to be part of the, the Oregon wine industry. But, you know, sometimes when things are, are right in front of you, you really don't notice them for a while. And I, and I certainly didn't until I was, I don't know, in, in my 20s at least. My dad made wine growing up. And so, you know, I'd be in and out of the winery all the time, after school, before school, during school, whatever. And, and you know, I, I'd get to explore all of the wineries and the fun things for kids. I don't know if, if, if you know, but wineries are super fun places for kids. There's like so much stuff to climb. And I'd usually head straight toward the barrel room for some barrel climbing or case storage for some case climbing or, you know, the, the fittings wall and just build a wacky thing out of out of all the, the pipe fittings that they have there. You know, after after getting a little bit older, I started working in, in the wine industry first at Nick's Italian Cafe in McMinnville, um, which was awesome. I loved that. And for my dad, really my whole life, you know, labeling wine, dipping wax toppers, whenever anybody considers a wax top on their on their bottle, I, I cringe a little bit. Just remember all of the hours over a crock pot. Then after working at Nick's, um, I worked at Argyle for Rollin. Um, that was great, but still, this was just, you know, I'm, I'm finished with high school, just trying to make a little bit of money. This isn't, this isn't a career choice. These are just people I know and options I have. And then I finally decided to go to, to school in Portland. I started at PSU and that's where I met my wife. She had a big, big role in that decision. Thought maybe I ought to get on this college thing. But, um, so I started up there. And then even in Portland, I mean, my job during school was I worked for Jessica Ensworth, driving a delivery van and, and stocking shelves. And so, you know, wine has always kind of been right there next to me. So, you know, I'm looking around everywhere. I don't, I don't see it. Uh, and then after a couple of years in the city, um, I was studying anthropology at PSU, which I loved, but it kept coming back to agriculture, you know, and as this huge shift in, in, you know, human development, I guess. And I couldn't quite get that out of my head. My wife and I decided to transfer down to OSU and, you know, we moved down to Corvallis. It was great. And even then, it, I didn't jump into the wine program. Um, I studied horticulture. Vegetables intimidated me to no end. Uh, so many things can go wrong, but perennial fruit really spoke to me for some reason. I don't know. I don't know why. Maybe it was you know, years and years of, of, of pruning my dad's vineyard and and you know taking care of that or the periphery to wine. But um, I was really comfortable around perennial fruit, and I just studied general horticulture. I wasn't going to specialize in anything, but. You know, I knew all of the all of the old viticulture professors, and you know, I thought, why not? I'm 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 still I'm still general down here, but I'll take all the viticulture courses. You know, I'll do that. I'm I'm, I'm into that. That's great. It's perennial fruit, and I really appreciated, you know, grapes, especially uh, even compared to other perennial fruit crops. You know, we're surrounded by cherry orchards out here. Like the relationship between the research at the universities and the extension service, private industry and research, and um, the connection with the winemakers, you know, and kind of being able to participate in the life cycle of this fruit the entire way along was really resonated with me. And so, yeah, finally I just decided to, to jump in with both feet. And, um, you know, I, I really became more invested in grapes uh, rather than wine. Um, I love wine. I love working in the cellar. It's great, but I think I'm happiest when I'm, when I'm outside, you know, I'm moving my feet and, you know, I can try to understand what, what the landscape is doing or what I think it wants to do and, and sort of like translate that through the grapes. 
um, which is another way, reason why I like grapes. You can't really, you can do that with, with other crops, of course, but with grapes, you know, it, it all goes into the narrative of what the vineyard is doing, and you can talk about it with winemakers, and they're interested, and you can follow through with them and see what happens and take their feedback and, and incorporate that into the farm, but, but you're always mindful of where you are, what the weather is doing, and it's just, it's a very connected place for me in a way that the cellar was not, but, you know, I still, I still absolutely enjoy it and respect winemakers and, and what they do. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm from a family from them. I still, I'm still in the winery quite a bit, more, more, more than the average viticulturist, I think, but, um, you know, it's a great place to be. And then we decided to come back to the gorge area here, where, where we are now, we're in the Dalles. Um, I have, my family is from Hood River. I grew up in McMinnville, but my dad grew up in Hood River. You know, this is where his little vineyard has always been. And, you know, we'd always come stay at grandma's house. And so the opportunity came to move back here. And that was just terribly exciting for me because the, the, the grape industry out here is still, I mean, absolutely in its infancy. We've got Oh, 1,400 acres of, of grapes now around there. Um, there was a nice survey a few years ago uh, from PSU uh, that kind of counted everything up. Vineyards here are far flung, they're small, they're remote, and they're really, really diverse. Um, the climate here is not as consistent as in other places like the Willamette Valley or Walla Walla where you kind of can know what to expect a little bit more with precipitation and, and heat accumulation and all. And here, it's diverse is the word I like to use. It's, it's not variable. Here in the Dalles, you know, this little section of the Dalles, we're kind of understanding what to expect. But you go 10 miles west and it's radically different. And so we can grow an awful lot of different types of, of grapes, an awful lot of different cultivars. And that really excites me as a viticulturist. Um, there's just so much to, to play around with. You mentioned uh, horticulture first and then into viticulture. We, mm -hmm. We've heard that path before. Was there anything unique about grapes or about viticulture that, that, was, that you had to learn and, or, or something that excited you about them uh, versus other kinds of things? Yeah, you know, if, if we could go back to the, the anthropology thing that, that I you know, studied for a little while early on, um, I really liked how grapes have have interacted with, with humans for so long. Um, you know, we've got thousands of years of humans and grapes having a relationship together in, in a way that we don't have with an awful lot of other plants, food crops, sure, but they change so quickly and so dramatically. I mean, you can look at apples right now and, and you, can't, you can't give Red Delicious away. Um, with grapes, we've got these cultivars that are so old and have been around for so long that we just have this, you know, huge catalog of information and experiences and so on. And that's super stimulating to me. I like marketing the fruit myself. Um, I have worked in pairs and I always get a little bit sad at harvest time because you pick your pears and, and you can sell some direct to consumer in farmer's markets and so on. And that's great. Love it. But to pay the bills, it's got to go in a bin and it's got to go to a packing house and you just never see it again. It's like, could, could, be at, could be at Costco, could be at your local grocery store, could be in China, you just never know. Um, and so with grapes, like I can, I can call up our, our winemaking partners and, and, you know, for lack of a better word, invite myself over to their winery uh, and, and jump in. And you don't get to do that with an awful lot of other uh, products. And then I also appreciate all of the research and science that, that goes into grapes. Um, the extension in Oregon and Washington and California and I mean, geez, every, everywhere really, in, in the East Coast and the middle of the country. I mean, it's just fantastic. You can call up somebody who spends their, their life studying grapes and ask them a question you know, and if they don't know the answer, then you can set up a, a trial, and there's so many cool things you can do with grapes. And you can do that with a lot of other crops too, but um, 
the, 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 the people in grapes are, are really great to work with. And there's a lot of people doing it, and it's, it's fun to talk to your neighbors, and there are a lot of variables that we can play with in the vineyard that, you know, we're not quite as tied to cost breaker of production as some other cultivars. You know, a wheat field might have, if, if, if this is going to cost $15 per acre, like you really need to sit down and, and, and think about it because that's going to end up being hundreds of thousands of dollars and there's not as much room for experimentation as grapes have. Um, you know, I can do something crazy on one row and, I don't know, cut off every 17th cluster and, and see what happens and it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to set me back. It's, it's just going to be more, more data to play with. So you mentioned, obviously, you grew up in the industry. You grew up, grew up with the industry right there. Mm -hmm. What was your, did you have an impression of vineyards before you started working in them? Did you have much uh, interaction? Yeah, I worked in my, my dad's vineyard, most of all, and a handful of other vineyards around. But you really, you know, get to experience the plants. And so some cultivars, like, have, have really interesting characteristics. You know, my dad had a Riesling vineyard and going out and, and pruning that thing and walking through it, it was like the plants are, are whippy and, and rangy and they don't have a lot of like, you know, the canes will go wherever you bend them. They just kind of flop all over the place and they can hurt and you can like cut your fingers on them. And, and so it would be like you experience that in one vineyard and it's like, okay, that's Riesling. That's fine. That's the one that, you know, will whip your cheek and, and, and hurt. And then you go to somebody's Pinot Noir vineyard and it's a little bit more there's a little more structure, it's a little more woody, you know, and you can kind of cut it and the cane will just fall to the ground and then and then you sort of understand that. So before, you know, I knew anything about wine or, or, or could drink or anything, I had these experiences with different grape cultivars and just kind of how they acted in the field and what that felt like for me, you know, on the ground. Is the vineyard mowed or does it have all these little burrs that are getting in my in my pants and, and making me uncomfortable or, or something like that? So uh I liked having that kind of personal relationship first before, you know, learning all this, this stuff about them that I know now because, you know, it's kind of humbling when you're interacting with something like that and you don't know anything about it and it's just, you just get to listen to what it tells you, you know, before you learn all this information and then, you know, early in my career after, after college and all that, I thought I knew everything. It's like, you just go out and, no, this needs to look like that and this needs to do this and... Some of that, I think, was tempered by my earlier experiences, and then, you know, the rest of it was tempered just by... Nobody, nobody wants to work with somebody like that. <laughs> so. well, tell me about your... So, having have with that as a background, once you kind of started on the viticulture path, tell me about mm -hmm. your first sort of professional vineyard experience and, and what, what it was like for you. Well, my first professional experience, you know, out of college, I was hired as an intern for a, a large vineyard in Mosier, for working for Tom Garnier and his uh, GM, Dan Ziegenbein, and, and the crew with uh, Alfredo Quintana. And it was just, it was great. I mean, there was, I think maybe I could have used a little more structure at that point in my career as, you know, a 20 year old who thinks he knows everything, but uh, it, it, it was awesome. They had a lot of cultivars out there. They had a lot of variability. Um, they had irrigation, they had, they had dry farm, they had cherries, they had, you know, old equipment, new equipment, and it was a nice place to be, um, because I just got to practice and see, you know, what people knew, what people didn't know, what, you know, I could create to help, especially working with the crew and between kind of the crew and the management and, and because a lot of people, you know, kind of intuitively understand a lot of things that need to happen out there. And then the manager is, is sort of like, well, why would I do that? You know, and I was able to kind of quantify some of these things. You know, Alfredo had excellent ideas about irrigation and, and, and this and that. But um, I could put that into a document and say, you know, if you're running the irrigation for this long and we're dripping this much and, and so on and kind of help dial in some programs there, which is great. Um, and then just, you know, you, you don't learn a lot of industry quirks in the school, especially in agriculture. I mean, there's just uh, kind of making things work um, isn't, isn't, there's, there's not a class about that in college. It's like, okay, this, this fell off my tractor. 
do I zip tie it or do I duct tape it? It's like, <laughs> well, what do you have in your pocket? So I really liked kind of learning some of those skills about just making things work with what you have around you. You don't have a hammer, but you got a rock, so go to town. Then after that, I, I kind of did two things at once. I started my own management company. That was great. Um, you know, I started with 20 acres and then it just grew exponentially because the demand out here for viticulture was um, astronomical. You know, a lot of folks had vineyards and, and were just kind of wondering what else can we do or is this right or can you help me with that? I learned a lot about uh, equipment operation and logistics, you know, we're just hauling stuff all up and down the gorge to, you know, uh, labor management and talking with people and making sure everybody is, is taken care of and working well and getting what they need. And then experiencing so many different vineyards in so many different states of development and ages and, you know, you could have a vineyard with 12 foot row spacing and 8 foot plant spacing that hasn't been fertilized or analyzed in 40 years compared to, you know, a high density thing that, that was, you know, state of the art irrigation and all this stuff and just kind of, it just allowed me to uh, deal with, with grapes, more grapes, more grapes, more things, um, and kind of get a picture of what things looked like. Um, and then after a couple of years of that, um, uh, Rick Ensminger uh, gave me a call. Um, he was, of course, the longtime manager at Salila Vineyard. Um, and I was farming some properties adjacent to his. And he, <laughs> he, he really just needed a tractor driver. But <laughs> I was like, well, shoot, if, 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 if Rick calls and asks for help, it's like, you got to get in there. Like, this guy's been doing this for so long. He has an immaculate vineyard. Um, it's, it's renowned across the world, really, and he's working with, with some of the best winemakers in, in Washington and Oregon, and it's just like, okay, Rick, whatever you need. And so <laughs> I was running a business while driving Rick's, I think he had a 1962 John Deere 1020, <laughs> like, and I don't know if you've been up to, I know you... Rick was interviewed for this program a while back, but I don't know if you've been out there. Mm -hmm. Underwood is a magical place. And in the summer, with Rick's program and everybody's program, really, it was dusty. So I'd be wrapped up on the tractor, no cabs or anything, you know, bandanas, goggles, sunglasses, email in one hand, just like mowing with a two-wheel drive tractor on a side slope like this and just uh, rolling around with Rick. Um, troubleshooting plants, you know, you'd be like, Joe, what do you think's going on over there? I'd be like, oh, I don't know, I'm going to jump out and dive in, and I'd come up with an elaborate, you know, list of everything that it could be, and he's like, nope, it's gophers. I'm like, <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> and, um, yeah, it, it was great. And I worked with him for, uh, I don't know, two, three years, um, and learned just as much as I learned in, in college. It's not a competition, you know, it, it all complements. Um, I was really thankful for that experience. And then ultimately, um, you know, the, the good doctor that started the place, he, he, he died, his kids kind of took over and, and, you know, decided they, they wanted to let that go. And um, Corliss came out and, and bought it. And, uh, there's just a lot of, you know, transitional stuff, and I was trying to kind of decide if I wanted to, you know, stick around there or continue with running my business, and um, I chose to, to keep going with my business, um, which I'm glad I did. I really didn't want to give up kind of having my toes in all of, all of the pools around. Like, it's just so stimulating. Um, and, you know, I was still farming properties on Underwood, so I could still have an Underwood experience. And I had properties in the Dalles and, and Hood River and Mosier and White Salmon. And we kept going with that for a number of years. Um, and it was good. Uh, I liked it a lot. You know, business management, 
it's not my favorite thing in the world, but you know, it's, it's, it's a mechanism, you know, it was a mechanism for me to, to do just what I absolutely loved. Mm -hmm. You know, I like being able to do everything. Um, sometimes I, I'd be out pruning, sometimes I'd be, you know, spraying, I'd be in the office plenty of times. It was great, but it was a ton of work. Um, but that is ultimately what led me to this project. See, so I just had a, a, a phone call one day from a gentleman named Reed Stewart. He's from Le Grand originally. He had an irrigation company out there. You know, he was in agriculture his, his whole life. And he started working for the owner of this property, David. Um, and he was just kind of out scouting things around. You know, David was, was looking for property to, to plant a vineyard on to kind of, you know, be the bridge between his, his two other projects. I just got a call from this guy, Reed, who got my name from the irrigation supplier in Hood River, from, from Dick. And he's like, hey, you want to come look at this piece of property? I'm like, sure, that's what I do. I'd love to. Um, I was farming a little vineyard just a quarter mile up the road from this property, so I was familiar with the area and the neighbors and, and all that. And, you know, came and looked out here and I mean, I, I, I really liked what I saw. It was, it didn't look like this. It was, it was a bit of a mess. It was a feral hay field. We had some dryland alfalfa down there and cereal rye up here. And it, you know, the previous owner sort of did hay on it and kind of didn't really the past few years. And, um, and it just had a lot of stuff in the field, a lot of, a lot of boats an unbelievable amount of boats, like hundreds, hundreds of boats. Uh, <laughs> cows were drinking out of some of them and some of them were just out here. And, you know, old farm equipment and there was some old spin weeders under the ground and um, the ancient harvester parked right up there. But it was really easy to kind of look through that and see the landscape and be like, oh my gosh, this place is everything. Like, it's kind of a microcosm of the gorge. Um, it's got north slopes, it's got south slopes, it's got, you know, like two acres of perfectly flat ground, and that's it. And, you know, we've got almost a thousand feet of, of elevation difference in the, the planted acres. The property goes from, what, 600 to, I think, 1,800. Uh, the grapes are about, a thousand to sixteen fifty, and I said I was really excited about the, the potential here. And he's like, "Okay, cool, I'll get back to you." So I'm like, "All right, great." You know, this 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 happens a lot. People call me up to, you know, evaluate their their projects. Evaluate is a strong word, just to stare at it and say, you know, without having any more information, this looks cool to me. Uh, you know, next steps are are so on, but. Um, yes, yeah, so we didn't hear back from Reed for a little while. I just, you know, kept doing my thing. And then, um, you know, he'd, he'd be in contact a little bit. And he'd be like, listen, uh, I'm going to come back to Hood River. We're super interested in that property. I'm going to bring the owner, David, out. And we'll talk to you. And I said, okay, great. So we met at a coffee place in Hood, Hood River and just chatted for a while. I didn't know anything about David at this point. Um, but we, we really got along kind of right away. One thing when you're farming for a lot of different people, there are a lot of different personalities and philosophies and, and this and that. And, and as a custom farmer, you try to, you know, you want, you ultimately, you want to do what, you know, the proprietor wants you to do. Um, but you also kind of want to steer them toward what you consider to be best practice a little bit. And with David, there was none of that. It was just like, we were right on with, with what we wanted to do, you know, as far as, as philosophy out here. We wanted to be organic from the very beginning. We wanted to um, promote biodiversity, native landscapes. Like, we wanted, we didn't want to put a vineyard in the Dalles. We wanted to, you know, have the Dalles make a little vineyard um and so that was great like we just totally totally got along and he's like all right joe you know we'll get back to you and i said okay cool you know i'm all excited about that uh, it's harvest time at this point i go back to you know 
they've got lots of grapes to pick. Um, and then, yeah, later that December, he's like, yeah, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna buy it and we want you to, to develop it. I'm like, awesome, let's do it. So then, you know, we really dove into the research and the analysis and, 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 and all these skills that I, that I, that I learned at OSU. You know, the Dalles is already an agricultural region. We have, we have really robust, you know, weather system out here that I could pull from and, and really kind of get a good picture of what was going on here. We did soil analysis, soil pits, um, all of that, and put together a program. Uh, shared that with, with David and Reed and Edwin, who's the GM of, of Mitchell Wine Group. And that was kind of a new experience for me as well, like working on a team like that. And it was, it was just great. Like <laughs> you'd say, I need help with this or, you know, can you do that or, or whatever. And, and, you know, we all kind of sifted through all this data I put it, put together and, and, uh, started with a big list of, I don't know, 45 cultivars and narrowed that down to just a meager 18. <laughs> Uh, to plant out here and then kind of you know over overworking that winter with David and, and Reed and Edwin and, and everybody else involved in the project uh, David was kind of like hey Joe why don't you just why don't you just work just for me and I'm like maybe like you know it, it was everything I wanted out here it was a blank slate you know I could I, I did all of the preliminary data collection, which is a big piece you miss when you take over somebody else's vineyard. Um, and you know, you make phone calls to previous farmers and you hear this and you hear that. And you know, that was a wet spot and that was a dry spot and, and this and that. But, but when you're out there from the very beginning and you get to just kind of look at, at the grass and what is out here, you just have a wildly different perspective. And so and then all the support with the organics and you know, I got to choose the equipment and, and, and everything. So it was just kind of like, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's go, let's go all in. And it was great. We, in 18, did all of the site prep, uh, put in the trellis, the irrigation, you know, the David's other company, Mitchell Lewis and Staver is, I mean, it's like, it's, it's just a perfect match. They do, you know, precision irrigation well controls. And so, He's like, let me handle that. I'm like, great. <laughs> I got my hands full. <laughs> you know, so we have this incredible system that just sips power uh, and gives us just as much water as we need for whatever section or number of rows or whatever we want to irrigate. And then working with Edwin, it was like, his job is to sell wine. So I was like, okay, you know, what cultivars? I think all these will grow and perform well. You know, like, that's kind of my part. And then he's like, okay, let's, what do we think we can sell, you know? Um, who wants what and so we were just able to talk to all my contacts his contacts and just kind of make a list of what we thought would both be really happy in the Dalles and would be desirable for Oregon winemakers and Washington too while we're here let's talk about I'm, I'm curious you mentioned the blank slate and how mm -hmm. appealing that was to you so in your role how did you look at what you had here and visualize what it could be. What was your sort of your mechanism for that? And, and how did you approach sort of the process of turning it into that? It, 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 was, it was kind of easy out here because the terrain is so extreme. It's so dramatic. The soil we have, you know, in the, the cultivated area is uniform. The soil where we're sitting now on this, you know, on the soil survey, it's a rocky outcrop. It is indeed a rocky outcrop and it's covered in these gorgeous oaks and like we didn't we didn't want to we didn't want to force the vineyard on top we didn't want to bulldoze we didn't want to we didn't want to rip we didn't want to move soil around you know we had to do we had to put some headlands in to be able to farm you know we've got a little cut up there and, and another one just below us here but i mean just 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 looking at it the vineyard could only fit one way you know, we've got a few different aspects. There's no terracing. Uh, we work kind of with our with our hillsides, and so we we put the grapes where I think they wanted to be, as far as 
the soil is doing, what the, what the hillsides are doing, and so on. It, it, uh, I guess I'm not articulating that terribly well, but it just seemed to be, this is what, this is what fits. When it came to pick, choosing varietals, you mentioned you had a big list, you made a smaller list. Uh, tell me about planting what where and, and how it's gone so far. Um, it's been, the vast majority has been very successful. I think we made a lot of good decisions. Um, this block up here is kind of the most experimental, we'll say, but so far it, it seems pretty happy. Um, yeah, this is where we kind of pulled from, you know, I'll go ahead and say thousands of years of viticultural data across the world. I mean, obviously, you know, we, we've had computers and the internet and universities for a small portion of that, but, you know, we looked at places where the climate was similar to the Dalles and where the soil was similar to the Dalles. And we found, you know, looking at Europe, we found parts of Spain and parts of France and parts of Italy, you know, that, that were pretty close. And we're not trying to like, you know, emulate that, you know, we're not trying to make this Italy or, or, or something like that. It's still, this is, this is Oregon. The wine industry is, you know, decades old, like, which to me is kind of a strength that's exciting. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to say this whole thing has to be Grenache because that's the only thing that's going to work right here. Like, I'm glad we get to play around a little bit right now. But we looked at places that, that matched somewhat and saw what performed well there and kind of tried to translate that a little bit here, you know, understanding that it's a different place. We don't know for sure. There were a couple cultivars that I know do really well in the Dalles. You know, we've got, we've got quite a bit of Syrah um, and it's super happy. I mean, it's the first thing we planted. It's like, we love this. <laughs> and so that was nice to see. And then, you know, we've got some Grenache, which is also happy, but you know, Grenache, Grenache takes a little bit more energy from me to, for it to do what I would like it to do, you know, within the framework of Grenache is going to Grenache, but, you know, it's, it's so much more sensitive to, to wet spots and, and, you know, late, or late season cold and precipitation and so on. It'll just respond right away where some of these other plants are like, we're getting sleepy. The Grenache is like, what else can we do? Um, I planted about two acres of Grenache in a spot that turns out had a late season seed combined with, you know, I wouldn't consider them to be to be uh, terrible November temperatures, but the Grenache is like, we're just gonna grow. We're just gonna do it. And it got fried. Um, but it was happy on the other side of the farm. So we just kind of kept it going over there. Yeah, so there's a lot of trial and error to be honest, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of, Know, evidence like we're not we, we feel like we've got a good selection here and it, and it seems to be happy so you have, you have obviously you mentioned one of the, the, the pleasures of your past work was being able to work in a lot of different places mm -hmm. and having your toes in all the different spots so tell me about some of the the different vineyards you've worked in and some of the sort of unique challenges uh, along the way and perhaps how that has played into your work here so far you know starting in the Willamette Valley we would work on, you know, there's, there, there's, there's, there's generally a lot of vigor in the Willamette Valley. And so that's kind of what I grew up working with and, and managing. So, you know, that kind of gave me a good framework for things like plant density, cover cropping, canopy management, timeliness. Uh, Cause out here, you can have those things, definitely, especially in, in Hood River. Um, you know, it's fertile valley bottom. Um, it, it, it can be quite similar. But, you know, over here in the Dalles, much drier, so vigor can be lower, that sort of thing. Um, but that also kind of taught me, like, what you can get away with as far as plant density goes. So a lot of the vineyards out here, you know, were planted on originally 12 foot spacing and then they're like let's tighten it up to 10 foot spacing and that was you know the famous the famous because that's how our orchard tractors will fit that's as tight as we can get it 
Um, and I was like, well, if we can plant on six feet in the Willamette Valley, like, we can certainly, we can certainly bring it in a little bit out here, I think, and not, and not have to suffer from it. Of course, kind of our biggest thing with row spacing out here is topography. Uh, so this farm is on eight foot spacing, and that's just so we can survive while we, while we farm it, you know. A lot of the times the tractor's going to crab walk, and you, you don't want to mow your, your six foot vine row on the side of a hill. Anyway, um, then coming out to the gorge, we have everything. Um, we really have everything. So even on that, that first farm in Mosier where I started, we had maybe not everything, but almost everything. We had a sandbar that's, you know, it's a great petri dish. It's, it's just, it's not going to do anything that you don't kind of ask it to do because it's in you know, it's in, it's in sterile medium, basically. So we got to play around there with, with mulching, composting, different types of fertilizer, you know, liquid, solid, um, different, different cover cropping, different uh, cultivating. And then on the very same farm, you know, go next to a spot that's part of kind of a, a, a drainage a little bit. And it's just like the Willamette Valley again. It's, it's, high density, massive vigor. You have to hedge it, you know, three times a year. And then going over to Underwood, again, super, super, super deep soil, tons of precipitation, low fertility. So, you know, Rick's place working with him, things like, and also it's unirrigated. So floor management kind of, you don't have a lot of wiggle room, you know, and there's a lot of potential to make mistakes and so you need to really be on top of your mowing program you don't want it to get too competitive but you don't want to mow it too quick or too much because then you've got a dust bowl and it's just um you can learn a lot there but still a lot of vigor because you know you've got 80 feet until uh, a solid layer in the soil um, white salmon is kind of like a hybrid of these two places so you can sort of and so Mosier is, is kind of like halfway between the Dalles and Hood River, and then you've got Lyle, which is similar. So you have all of these different aspects, and they all kind of swirl together, and, and, and you learn a lot um, about, and you've kind of seen a lot of things. So, you know, looking out here, we you dug soil pits. They're deep and low density, so, you know, I think a little bit about Okay, I've seen this before on Underwood. The difference is they get, you know, 65 inches of rain, we get 12. So how, how are my plants gonna respond there if, they can, if they, can, they can go down just as far as they want, but they don't have the precipitation. So, you know, maybe tighten up the density a little bit, but not too much. Um, because it's definitely not the Willamette Valley or Hood River with fertile, fertile, high density soils with, you know, clay and, and whatever. And then think about, but we are irrigated out here. So how is that going to translate into our, our floor management? Can we do an annual cover crop? Like, do we want to till? Like, you know, let's try it. We try it. Don't like it. Um, so you, yeah, you, you, you just, you have, there's, there's, there's a lot to experience out here and, um, being all over the place early in my career, it's really nice to be able to see all of it. You know, if you've been in one place for a long time, um, that's great. And there's like a deep understanding that you can get there. That's, you know, that's, that's, I think that's equivalent for sure. But um, then if you do move, it's like you have to learn a lot of things really quickly uh, and you make mistakes and everybody makes mistakes as part of farming. But um, it was just a huge gift for me. And I think it's kind of synonymous with the region out here. And I think those lessons are things that I can kind of, I can kind of share with, with everybody that comes out here. You mentioned earlier that one of the, one of the, you, you kind of your role as, as vineyard manager with, with uh, having clients was, you know, kind of going with what they wanted, but also mm -hmm. trying to steer them towards kind of, you know, they said best practices. So tell me, as you were out here, what did you, what was your sense of where viticulture was out here and how has it changed since you've been, since you've been involved in the area? Yeah, vit viticulture out here is uh, everywhere. It's, it's, it's a really nice place to grow fruit. I mean, there's like 80s Yakima style farming. There's, there's 
California style farming. There's Oregon farming, whatever that is. And, uh, it's, it's exciting. Um, you know, kind of, kind of the important things for me that, that I wanted to share with, with the people I was working for, you know, were things, a lot of things that, that I learned in college, you know, things like sprayer calibration. Yeah, equipment was another big one, um, for me, like, you know, we would, we would kind of advocate for cabs on tractors and especially in vineyards, you know, uh, and there'd be things like, well, in the pairs, they don't fit and everybody seemed fine. So let's just, let's just save the money and, and keep going. And it's like, I mean, you're, you're not wrong, but, uh, let's think about lung health in 25 years. But anyway, yeah. So, uh, and then another, you know, I consider organic production and vineyards to be best practice. Um, especially in this region. I mean, our pest pressure compared to some other regions is significantly lower. Um, you know, if we compare to the Willamette Valley, we spray half as much. Um, this year, mildew pressure is, is very high, so we're, we're still on a seven-day cycle right now. But usually, I mean, we can get away with six sprays a year. Um, last year, we could have done less, but it's always easy to go back and say we could have done less than, oh gosh, I don't have any fruit because it's, uh, it's all mildewy. But um, so that was something that, that, that I would encourage a lot of the time, you know, just stick with the sulfur spray early season. Uh, we, don't need to, we don't need to go too hard with, with other chemistries. And, you know, for, for no other reason than it's just, it's, it's just kind of easier. We don't need to use restricted use stuff and we can keep our applicators safe and, and just kind of minimize risk as much as we can because... Um, in my mind, there wasn't a lot of justification for um, those other materials, you know, other than trying to get a 21-day window out of something. But um, oftentimes with the climate, we can do that regardless. Mowing orchards, you mow pretty much all the time because you have people moving through all the time and you're irrigating all the time. Grapes, we're not doing that. But still, you know, we'd have people mowing vineyards just constantly and it's like, you know, that looks great. Maybe you've got your tasting room there and there's people. That's that's fine. But, you know, out in the field, like, let's let's let some stuff grow. Let's have some habitat. Let's save some fuel and, and, and focus on other things. Another contentious one that I would run up against a lot of times is crop load, which, I mean... <laughs> I think I think that's always a big a big topic for growers. But again, in in, in college, you know, we learned about uh, vine balance, and kind of that's you know a really nice system for being able to quantify a lot of your your decisions. If you can, you know, have sustainable growth, like you're probably good with the crop load. If it's if it's decreasing, you know, maybe you're you're too high, or if it's increasing, you're too low. And so, folks with you know, 1980s vineyard spacing would be thinning fruit down to, you know, one cluster or, or taking shoulders off and this and that and wondering why, you know, their plants were going crazy or their yields were dropping or the opposite problem. You know, you'd have no fruit thinning in a canopy this big and it would just kind of be like, what's going on out here? And we just try to quantify some of that decision making. And sometimes folks are great and sometimes folks are you know, no, I read this out of Davis in, in 1992, and we need to drop our Merlot. It's like, okay, you know, whatever, whatever works for you. Fertilization was another big one. People can be quite timid around fertilizer with grapes, you know. No nitrogen, just zero. It's going to make them explode. Uh, we're going to get laterals. We don't want to do anything. And it's like, well... If your canopy is here right now, like in August, maybe maybe some explosion is in order. So I think those are kind of my, my oh, and irrigation too. Everything, everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, they're, you know, we've, generally we have pretty good access to water out here and in tree fruit, often it's just open the tap, you know, fruit gets big, you get a bigger check, you're great. These grapes, we want a little more management there. And so over-irrigating, under-irrigating. Uh, overall, over all of these things, my goal is just always to kind of have a quantifiable framework for decision-making. Like, why are you irrigating like this right now? You know, 
you've got a reason, great. Let's make a note, compare that season over season, you know, see what the grapes are doing and just kind of just write some of this stuff down. There's a lot of farming by feel, which is also great. People can do it. So out here we have a lot of, I mean, everything we've got. We've got, you know, the non-resident proprietors, you know, in California that see their vineyard once a year and it's like, go to town, make it work. And then we've got people that live right there and they're out spraying and mowing and, and, and doing it all. Um, and they generally do understand what their vineyard needs uh, just, just by feel. Um, and I just wanted to be able to quantify it and say, okay, you know, that is the wet spot. The soil moisture is this, you know, the soil moisture there is that. This, this irrigation set has this result, this one does this, you know, and just kind of, kind of get it all out there so we can always point and refer to, to something in our decision making. Does it feel like it's changed? A, a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, it, 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 it has, I mean, you know, it's, it's, people are coming out here. There's a lot of young winemakers that are really interested in the gorge and they're getting involved and older winemakers and everybody. Like it's kind of going from, you know, a place where you can grow grapes and to, to something people are, are, are looking at. And when people are kind of confronted with questions about what they're doing or why they're doing it, you know, they, they, they already know, but it kind of, you know, makes that dialogue happen and, and they can kind of start sharing that. And yeah, I think they are. So tell me about for your own, from your own perspective, uh, either uh, if you're walking into a vineyard for the first time or if you're looking at a potential vineyard, what are the kind of the main things you're, you're judging in terms of uh, vineyard health, vineyard mm -hmm. viability, and uh, how long does it take you to feel like you, you know a place pretty well? Um, it, it takes at least a whole season, um, absolutely, and, and these past few years have been so variable that, I mean, it, it's, it's endless, and it really depends on, on the time of year, like, you're always learning something, I will never know everything there is to know about, about this farm. Yeah, canopy growth is always an awesome indicator, um, and uniformity, you know, if, if you're looking out over a field and you can see, you know, a pattern of lower vigor or higher vigor or something like that it's just right there in front of you you know something's going on and that can be any number of things it can be a wet spot it can be where the compost pile was it can be you know uh, a lot of different things and then I look at the vineyard floor kind of for the same reason um, I look at plant diversity um, and I often look at the you know, the undervine area as well. And I like to see if it's funky and, and you know, and, and weird, or if it's got plants and it has plants in it, how many and what kind, or if it's cultivated. Yeah, and I, I, I guess I, I really try to understand water and how the water moves through the farm. You mentioned this place here and you said you, you'll, you'll never know it all, but how do you feel you're coming along with your understanding of, of this space? Good, I think we got, I think we got pretty much everything close enough to, to optimum that it's going to be, you know, successful. There are some things, you know, I would do differently if we were to develop another project. The soil had a lot to say that I didn't anticipate, um, particularly with its, you know, it can be a little bit volatile. It's, it's really low density. Um, just traffic through the vineyard would, would turn things up in a way I, I did not expect. Uh, it looked you know, closer to kind of a, a, a higher density, you know, Hood River soil, something like that. And it just got churned up in a few spots, you know, roadways mostly. But I mentioned we tried a couple of uh, different cultivation methods and it was, it was very clear right away, you know, perennial cover here. Like, let's, let's get it in there. And then the density is, is always, sort of, you know, it's always a variable. It's like, should we have gone a little bit tighter there? Maybe, but it's also probably fine where it is. That's kind of the one I'm really mulling over right now as it's still a young vineyard. And so there's still a lot of variability and, you know, a couple different different uh, stages of, of training. You know, we've got 
most of the plants are up on the wire with at least one arm, but we've got a handful of trunks and then a handful of uh, two-butted spurs still. Um, and it's, you know, important for photosynthetic efficiency to fill your canopy. Um, and I think, I think we're there, but I wonder, you know, maybe we should have gone a little tighter. Um, but we're definitely close enough to be happy. I mean... <laughs> It's exciting out here. It goes, it goes up and down, and sometimes, you know, I wonder if I could ever farm anything flat again. Probably, <laughs> probably not. I'd, I'd get bored. So, what are you looking ahead to then in this this space particularly? What's what's coming next here? Uh, production going up, transitioning from a developing vineyard to a mature, fully producing vineyard with that uniformity I mentioned, and responding to the plants with irrigation. You know, right now they're babies, their root system isn't entirely developed. Uh, they need water. Um, we haven't irrigated that yet this year. Maybe you can guess. It's, it's a little wetter than it typically is, but um, based on pits and, and soil data during development, you know, I think we may be able to get away from irrigation entirely in, in some of the blocks, most of the blocks even. Um, so that's something I'm really excited to uh, experiment with. And then also, you know, we, we talk about the vineyard and the grapes, but it's really an entire organism out here. And vineyard development has taken a lot of energy, you know, planting the grapes, doing the infrastructure, monitoring them as, as they grow, evaluating, you know, cultivar suitability, all of these things, selling fruit. Um, but, you know, we have... We have some relationships. We can see what's happening. We can understand some more things. Uh, we're not running around looking for materials. So we can kind of shift focus, you know, a little bit wider um, to the rest of the farm and the native landscape. And it, because it's all connected, you know, it's, it's not just one great plant and then another great plant. It's, it's a whole thing that's part of this whole thing. That's part of all of that. So, um, I'm really interested in doing some more uh, kind of native landscape restoration. We're in a pretty good spot when we found the property, and that was one of the things that was so exciting to me. I mean, we're surrounded here by uh, a nice population of native plants. And then planting more oak trees, planting some more pines at the higher elevations, uh, creating habitat and, and kind of fulfilling that vision of you know, not putting a vineyard on top of the Dalles, but kind of, uh, you know, the other way around, the Dalles having a vineyard. Tell me about the reaction you've had from winemakers who've been out here and people who've, who've either bought grapes or are thinking about buying grapes. What do, what do they think about it so far? Um, gosh, all, all the feedback we've been getting has been extremely positive. Uh, I haven't had anybody out, you know, you just give me a big old head shake and, and walk away. That hasn't happened. Um, yeah, people are, are into it. Uh, folks in the region, in the Gorge region come out and they're like, you know, they're excited to have the support, you know, that, that David was able to, to offer and kind of showcase what we can do out here. There aren't, there aren't a lot of big vineyards in the region. Part of that is topography. Part of that is there's already other, you know, crops planted, but part of it is just, you know, can can people do it? There are a couple big vineyards, as you know, that have kind of replaced other perennial fruit on, on, on different farms. But yeah, Celilo was the biggest for thirty five years, longer. Jeez, what year is it? Forty five years. Um, <laughs> and the Dallas can definitely support a big operation like this. And so, folks in the region are excited to kind of see what we're capable of out here i mean we all know it um and it's and it's really nice for it to materialize and, and to see and then folks from other regions uh, we work with a lot of folks from the willamette valley you know they they get out here and the vineyard it's kind of it's not quite hidden up here but you know you drive up at the bottom of a steep canyon and then you go up a little driveway and you pop out on the landing and it's like whoa <laughs> what <laughs> what is all this um and they get excited. You know, folks go up and down the gorge all the time and, and, and recreate, but you don't often head up in one of the canyons in the Dalles. And the Dalles is big. It is a 
big agriculture community. Um, there are thousands of acres of cherries out here, but you can't tell just from 84. You really have to get out here. Um, and so people get excited when they see it. And when they see, especially this time of year, when it's all green and we have all of these flowers blooming, um, it can get a little, it can get a little rugged later in the season, but we're not very far from the Willamette Valley. Um, and we're hot, there's options. And so people kind of, you know, they start wondering, you know, what, what's, what's going on out there? What can we do with all of this fruit? You know, we do something really well here in the valley that we're all happy with, but I think a lot of winemakers, you know, are very inquisitive people and, and, and like to experiment. And I think we can offer that to them here. The Gorge can as a region and, and Three Mile Vineyard can specifically uh, with our 18 cultivars and thousand feet of elevation change and aspects and all that. So I'm going to back up for, for a second or broaden out a little bit for a second and talk about the industry. Obviously, you, you have a pretty unique perspective. Mm -hmm. Looks like we're going to get one more shower here before we're done, huh? This is quite a June day in the Dallas. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, tell me about your sort of initial impression perspective of Oregon wine industry, uh, either f for, as a youth or as you started to get more interested in it in college, um, and how the, the industry has changed since uh, your kind of initial impression. I didn't really look at the Oregon wine industry, you know, as, as I kind of said before, until I was in, into my 20s. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of funny, like, looking back now, you know, I wish I kind of took some, some more opportunities to talk to people that as, you know, like, 18-year-old or 10-year-old or, or whatever. Like, hmm. <laughs> Who knows? You know, I remember my grandpa for his 80th birthday party a few years ago. I mean, at, at his house in McMinnville, it was like a, a who's who of, of, you know, a lot of these wine industry pioneers. Like, everybody that you would think of was there. And I don't remember how old I was, but it was, you know, like, oh, this is cool, talking to all these people. You know, like, like, <laughs> you know, I'd, 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 I'd buddy up with some people, but I, I just had no idea you know, what their accomplishments were or, or, or so on. But my first job was mowing the lawn of, of Laurent from uh, Northwest Wine. Mm -hmm. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, he's a pretty accomplished individual. I, I didn't know. I was mowing lawns. Um, but yeah, then as I got older and, you know, started, uh, it took a little bit more of an interest um, it, it's, it's fun. I mean, I think the Oregon wine industry, maybe before anything else, is just super fun. <laughs> There's so many opinions, and it's, it's, you know, kind of this interesting point where it's not, you know, it's, it's pretty well established these days, but it's, it's not California, you know, it's, it's not France. It's still the Wild West in a lot of ways, and that's really fun, because you can, you can, you can do whatever you want and kind of, you know, it's really collaborative in the wine industry. Um, it's not very competitive in my experience. Everybody has similar goals and they're all kind of doing them in different ways and they're, and they're all working together um, and talking to each other, which I just love. It's fun to, you know, kind of, kind of watch it grow and develop and all of the support we get from extension is just it feels like a gift i mean i think i think patty's great uh yeah so 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 it's cool there's no right answers there's no this is the way everybody's got to do this um yeah and so it's super stimulating and i mean you know like wine gatherings just <laughs> can't remember the last time i bought wine you just you just Oh, and hang out and talk to people and everybody's got a good story um it's, it's just a, a fun place to be so what comes next for oregon wine what comes next for oregon wine i think the wine industry being as young as it is um i think diversity is, is coming next for the oregon wine industry in every sense of the word um you know as a viticulturist the first thing i guess i'll say is, is grapes cultivars 
Pinot and Chardonnay are fantastic. We all love them, you know, and the Willamette Valley has that down, like, great. What else can we do um, is, is something I'm asking, and I think a lot of winemakers are as well, especially for, you know, things like their their wine clubs and their tasting rooms and so on. Like, let's get something, let's get something weird in there that nobody's ever heard of. Like, I've got 10 acres of Mencia. Like, what's that gonna do? I don't know. <laughs> But I'm really excited to see, and so are a lot of winemakers. Mm. I think farming and, and winemaking are kind of becoming, you know, even closer. They're always, throughout history, have been right up next to each other. I think that's continuing. I think um, we have more diversity in the vineyard with, with pepper crops and animals and cultivars and birds and whatever else and then I think um, you know the people within the industry um, you know you'd go to meetings 10 or 15 years ago and it would be it would be one demographic and then 10 years ago it's, you know might be look a little bit different and, and now you know it's still mostly one demographic but but it's it's shifting and i think that's great there's you know more ideas and and all of these things just kind of line up what about what's next for you um for me i'm i'm pretty darn happy with with where i am you know i mentioned kind of some of these whole farm perspectives that i'm interested in uh pursuing but um and then I also mentioned, you know, the data that I'm collecting, like, uh, I'd li I like to share that, you know, as, as years come along and, and talk about decision making and, and, and so on. And, you know, I, I like communicating with my neighbors and with, you know, other viticulturists. Um, and ultimately, you know, I'd like to kind of be able to, you know, maybe even be a model for, for, for some of that diversity. Um, you know, if, if some of our neighbors, you know, have a few more species per square meter of, of farmland, like, that makes me really happy to think about it. They look over here and see, gosh, there's a really successful vineyard. Everybody's super happy with it. Like, look at the landscape look at what's growing in the rows um you know let's try that too i think that's kind of the thing that that makes me most excited um you know because i'm in a place where i've got support and we can we can do some of these things and you know effective economical um be great if other people uh did that as well i'd like to plant some more vineyards around. Um, the house is just so awesome for grapes, and grapes fit in to the dowels so well. Like you don't have to do anything. Some of the blocks out here, we we didn't we didn't touch. We just put trellis in and planted, and it's like that's it. And and those are some of my favorite blocks. You know the stuff that was abandoned sooner than the rest of it and hadn't been farmed longer. Um, you know we've got some really resilient native plant systems out here and they they moved right back in and we're just like we'll just stick grapes on top and away we go all right well that's all the questions that i have for you uh, anything i didn't ask that i should have anything we didn't cover here today that we should have covered besides mm -hmm. ourselves I usually the question i ask after i'm I, I get really focused on something is where's sal but he's, he's right there <laughs> so we're good Thank you so much for your time, for inviting us up to this amazing space and, and talking about us. Tell us your stories and uh, watch you off the hook. Well, thank thank you. you so much.